Well, welcome to our Ask the Expert session. And this session is put together by the Multidisciplinary Surgical Access Group, uh, a committee of NAS that is an interdisciplinary committee that involves uh, both spine surgeons as well as vascular surgeons. And today we've got uh, two vascular surgeons as well as two spine surgeons, and we're going to address the issue of perioperative venous complications, including thromboembolic disease. And I'll ask our panel to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Teramani. Hi, I'm Dr. Teramani. I'm a vascular surgeon in San Diego. I spend the majority of my time approaching the uh, anterior aspect of the spine for uh, a number of spine surgeons in San Diego County. Jonathan Grauer, I'm an orthopedic spine surgeon at Yale at uh, New Haven, Connecticut. I'm Sigurd Bervin. Um, I'm, I'm at the University of California, San Francisco, and uh, I do quite a bit of work with complex spine surgery, including the anterior approaches. I'm Brian Kuhn. I'm a vascular surgeon from Cincinnati, Ohio, whose practice is dedicated to approaching the lumbar spine for my neuro and the orthopedic spine surgeons. So I'm going to start, John, with, with you. Uh, we recognize your expertise, and you've written some nice systematic reviews on uh, perioperative venous complications, as well as an evidence basis to what to do uh, for thromboembolic prophylaxis. What, what's the prevalence and what's the real importance of perioperative venous problems, including thromboembolic disease? Sure. So, I mean, obviously, we're all really sensitive to any adverse events. And for us, we usually quote about a few percent risk of VTE, obviously, depending on the scope of the surgery and predisposing factors. Uh, but it can significantly change the course, uh, both for the surgical team in terms of, you know, the concerns of anticoagulating somebody in a perioperative period, and certainly for the patient in terms of short-term and potentially longer-term stasis-related changes. Tom, what are some of the risk factors that we think about for perioperative thromboembolic disease? I think uh, a, a big risk factor is obesity, uh, having a hypercoagulable state, maybe the physiology of abnormal venous anatomy where you have a higher propensity to have a potential thromboembolic event like may Thurner syndrome, uh, any type of radiation to the pelvis, any history of having uh, VTE in the past increases your risk. So those are the, the, the big ones, I believe. And then, you know, just having surgery and having a prolonged period of time where you're on the table, supine, not moving, is a, puts you at increased risk. Yeah, Brian, with regard to surgical approaches, then what were your thoughts with regard to so many intraoperative risk factors, for example, prolonged retraction of the vein? And do you think there's a big difference if we um, do a direct lateral or an anti-SOAS approach versus a direct anterior approach? I certainly think there can be. Because if you're doing a direct anterior approach, you're approaching L45, that left commonly like vein is retracted out of the way quite a bit. And there could be quite a bit of stasis within that vein as it's retracted over during an anterior approach that you may not get during an oblique approach or a direct lateral approach. And so I think you need to be cognizant of how long you're retracting the vessel, how much pressure is on that vessel, uh, because those things can lead to stasis. And even certainly if you have an injury, then you have an endothelial damage to the inside of that vein, which is also known to be a hypercoagulable. Uh, effect at postoperatively, so definitely be aware of that with your approach. Yeah, let, let's go. Let's go to that in terms of an injury to the vein and uh, potential hypercoagulability. If there is a venous injury, an injury that may even require a stitch or repair, what what do you recommend for your prophylaxis in that case? So typically, what we'll do is we certainly will do a mechanical uh, prophylaxis postoperatively in those patients, and depending on what the injury is, depending on how was the vein narrowed? Was the vein not narrowed in that, in that repair? That, that's a very important thing to know. And, and so if you can evaluate that at the time of surgery, looking at the vein, if there's any question during that repair, it's very easy to do an intraoperative venogram of that left comulonic vein to see, has that vein been narrowed? Mm -hmm. Is there a luminal compromise to that vein? Because in that patient who has that luminal compromise is a much higher risk for having a DVT uh, postoperatively. Fortunately, the risk is pretty low. And even those patients, and we've found this in our database, uh, for our high users that even if there is a vascular injury to a left common iliac vein, even though it's rail, rare, we are not seeing associated iliac vein DVTs. And that could be related to the repair, the surgeon, how that repair is being performed. Uh, but it's a good piece of information to know. A lot of those DVTs, even though it's rare, are infrapopliteal tibial is what we found, and a very few femoral and popliteal vein DVTs. Do you mind if I just Please. pose some questions yeah. just to make a dialogue? Um, most of the vascular events we have are, are kind of these very small little tears from during the approach, rarely from other phases. Usually a stitch, and I know not everyone does that, but usually a stitch. 
we don't do anything different. I mean, those ones that you think about as kind of more typical are not hemodynamically compromising to it. And, and I just want to make sure I'm hearing you right, because for most of them, we don't, we don't do anything different. <clears throat> I agree 100%. There, there's no doubt. Um, those cases where there's a bad injury, yeah, you absolutely. Know, a lot of That's bleeding, a the vein requires reconstruction or you know, severe repair or something like that. Those are the cases I'm talking about, taking those extra steps to make sure that there's not a problem. Most of the times we don't even use stitches. Tom and I talk a lot of times, we're using hemostatic agents, what, most of the time? 65, 70%, Tom, isn't that what you say? Yeah. If we have a vascular injury, we're using hemostatic agents like your Everest, like your Tacoseal. The venous system is a low pressure system. And it's amazing how many times you will have thrombosis of that vein just with pressure and those hemostatic agents. How do you decide when we need to pull out a 5 proline or something even smaller? And how do you decide when a Tacoseal or an Everest is, is adequate? I think it's experience. I think when you first start in this arena of approaching the anterior aspect of the spine and you have a iliac vein bleed, your gut tells you to pull out a proline. And that's just the way you were trained. It's automatic. You know, if you take a proline, you can stop that bleeding. Uh, reality is you can stop 70 to 80% of that bleeding with a hemostatic agent. And I think the beauty of that is Often when you put that first stitch, that small little tear turns into a bigger tear and it's a bigger problem. So I think once you get over the hump of being able to calm down, put a hemostatic agent, release a retractor blade, let the pressures go down, the bleeding will stop. So it's just an experience issue. It's a volume issue. And once you get comfortable, uh, I, I have never regretted not putting a stitch in. So Tom, you and I have talked about mobilizing veins and certainly one of the things that I do, I know John routinely does, is uh, taking a recurrent jelly lumbar vein to really get a better exposure, especially at L4-5, to not take the risk of, of that being a, a source of tether and tearing. Uh, but in most of your approaches, you're actually able to leave some of the segmental veins, including the recurrent jelly lumbar. Can you talk to us about um, how you get to the anterior part, of especially at 4-5 uh, without taking the vein? Yes, yeah, it's predominantly for four or five where the iliolumbar vein or the ascending lumbar vein comes into play. And it's a judgment call when you need to take it. And I think that's a volume uh, issue when you have enough experience to look at it, say that's safe, I can rotate and I'm not going to cause an injury. Uh, you know, we, we ligate in our study of three high volume access surgeons, we ligate the iliolumbar less than 25% of the time and our complication rate is well below national average. So I think it's a, it, it is not mandatory to ligate that and the, the pure motions to go into play to ligate that vessel can result in significant amount of bleeding. Mm -hmm. So if you don't need the ligate, you're better off not ligating, but you have to be comfortable making that decision. Of course, the flip side though is, are you able to get everything over enough? Correct. Right. I mean, that's that's the concern is you're, you're wanting to get that last little bit and something's going to happen. And it's much harder to deal with at that point. And I think that's an important part of our database that we're looking at. Like I always document, does my spine surgeon put in a large implant or a small implant? Is there a reason we're putting in a small implant? And there sh if you're not taking the iliolumbar and that results in a compromised exposure, then you're not doing the right job for your spine surgeon. Yeah. And I also agree with, with that is it's not only can I rotate that vein out of the way in the current state, but what is that state going to be once that height has been restored? You know, the, the, yeah. if there's a big, big narrowing, no disc, that height's going to be restored with that a lift. what's that tension going to be on the vessel after that? That's where the experience comes in to, to, to seeing this. Because you can feel that tension on that vein change once that implant's been inserted. Is there anything we should look at preoperatively in terms of studies to identify when we might be at risk of having an intraoperative uh, venous injury? I think I look at all of mine just like you do, Tom. The, the preoperative MRI, you can identify where that iliolumbar vein is. It typically comes off the left common iliac vein about the mid course of the L5 vertebral body. That's kind of your standard anatomy. It can have a lot of variances, you know, can come off much higher. That can be a, an ascending lumbar vein that comes off, so that it looks like two of them. It can also come off much lower at the L5-S1 disc base, and those are the ones you really don't need to ligate. You're just taking extra time to try to find that vein, in, in my opinion, wasting time for that, for that patient. But you really need to know, and you can identify where that's, that's where preoperative planning 
comes into play. And, and as a team, as a spine surgeon, as a vascular surgeon, knowing this is the anatomy, I've identified all these factors. This is what my preoperative plan is. And then intraoperatively, does this correlate? And what, where do I go from there? Do I need to take that vein or not? I think on top of that, I think it's critical as a spine approach surgeon with, the, with your spine surgeon to really look at axial and sagittal cuts and look at the bifurcation, number one, of the abdominal aorta, number two, the inferior vena cava, and number three, the internal iliac artery and vein. And we found about 15 to 20% of the time, we're approaching four or five below the bifurcation of the IVC in the crotch between the iliac vasculature instead of your traditional swing everything from left to right. And I think those cases where we were now below the bifurcation, you would have to take that iliolumbar if you went off lateral. Yeah. So that's an important thing to know what's the best approach to the spine. It's not always cookbook, let's go lateral to the left iliac artery and vein. John, the prevalence of perioperative thrombobolic complications has been reported quite variably, and you've reviewed that literature well. In, in terms of uh, um, perioperative imaging, we know that if we routinely get an MR venogram, which was one of the studies we did at UCSF, we will certainly see a much higher prevalence. Are the routine studies that you do, low extremity non-invasives, venograms, that you'll do uh, in any of your patients after uh, anterior spine surgery? Yeah, I don't think the evidence is there to do anything routine. Um, we really do it based on symptomatic issues. And, and most of the time, we have a low threshold to doing that. And so the overwhelming majority of them are negative. But whenever there's asymmetric swelling, a lot of times the workup is actually not even for the DVT, but a shortness of breath, a hypoxia, where we're going to get a spiral CT, really more as a safety measure. And as I say, most of those being negative, but, but we don't do anything as a routine practice. Let's talk about uh, perioperative uh, antifibrinolytics. And uh, preoperatively, we'll just go across the panel here. What, what do you recommend uh, in terms of a uh, perhaps a larger spine surgery, we've got an anticipated blood loss that might exceed 500 cc's. Uh, what, what are your recommendations with regard to antifibrinolytics in the perioperative period? And, and uh, do you have a specific dosing program for that that you recommend? Sir, pro, pro, post-operative prophylaxis for well, DVTs? Well, Preoperatively, pre actually, uh, uh, using uh, uh, preoperative uh, antifibrinolytics to try and avoid uh, bleeding, intraoperative bleeding. Oh, okay, yeah. gotcha. So uh, most of my experts use TXA. Yeah. is what everybody's using in, in, in my institution. And honestly, I defer to my spine surgeon whether they want to use it or not. So okay. I'm not the one making that decision. John, what, what are you using for? We become really TXA. liberal with TXA. Mm -hmm. um, there are a few things that even my colleagues are using it for that, that I'll back away from. Because a lot of times, I mean, unless it's going to be a, a large staged front back procedure, we're not going to approach the kind of border of giving a transfusion. Mm -hmm. But I do think that if we can keep that crit even just a few points higher, that the, the speed of the recovery, the mobilization, everything's going a little bit faster. So that's really why we become as liberal with it. Um, even some of the folks with history of DVT, it'd be interesting to hear what you guys think. Our, our institution is using it for a number of people. I'm not. Um, I just don't think the risk benefit is there and I'm worried about that in that situation. But unless there's a specific contraindication or something that's raising my concern specifically, that I, I worry I'd look back with regret for using it, we are using it with lower and lower threšolds. Tom, do you have concerns about TXA and thrombobolic disease? Very few period? of my spine surgeons are using that agent. And mm -hmm. I think they just look over to me and say, don't get into bleeding trouble. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and my goal is to reduce the bleeding numbers to in the low teens to the low 20s. And if I can do that, I've accomplished my goal anteriorly. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think certainly in, in larger surgeries and deformity surgeries, sort of more complex work that, that John and I do, uh, that's a pretty routine part of our, our care as well. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the patient with the history of DVT, patient perhaps with a stent, patients with known coronary disease, th those are concerns that might modify our, our utilization. Um, let's talk a little bit about routine perioperative prophylaxis against DVT because there's some real variation uh, amongst the panel. In terms of your recommendations, Brian, you, you said you're pretty much recommending mechanical prophylaxis even in patients who might have had a small injury. Is there anything else you Yes. <clears throat> so we also we use unfractionated heparin as well. Okay. And, and so from the anterior part, I don't worry about bleeding. If there was any bleeding in the operative field from the anterior approach, I, I took care of that. 
you know, there's nothing that's surgically going to be bleeding that I don't worry about unfractionated heparin causing any further bleeding. So as soon as postoperatively, immediately, I'm happy and okay if they start using it to prevent a DVT, especially in patients that are high risk. Okay. Yeah, and in my, in my practice, I'm routinely using early mobilization. We've got a strict ERAS protocol, routinely using mechanical prophylaxis, but it's only in the high-risk ca cases where I'm using chemical prophylaxis. In that case, I am actually tend to use an enoxaparin rather than unfractionated heparin. John, what about your practice? So we do use unfractionated heparin starting post-op day one routinely. And really, I mean, early mobilization, compressive boots, um, but it's kind of our, in our mind, our safety measure that we know as a marker that while they're in the hospital, mobilization is usually not as much. It's helping carry that bridge. And then we think of it by the time they're leaving the hospital, that's almost a marker of their degree of mobilization. We do not continue it beyond discharge. And John, you've written about the balance of risk and benefit, and of course, epidural hematoma, perioperative venous bleeding. So are there circumstances where the amount of bleeding or perhaps a, a tumor case or case with an open cord decompression? Are there cases where you might avoid uh, your um, unfractionated heparin perioperatively? I really don't think so. I really think across the board, we'd use unfractionated heparin uh, sub-Q. I think the question is some of those higher risk things will increase from that level in terms of how much anticoagulation we do on the higher risk concern cases. Okay. And Tom, what, what do you recommend in the pair of Our, My spine surgeons rarely use any type of sub-Q heparin. I think uh, the key not only of early ambulation is early get them out of the hospital. You made that point. And when we looked at our data of about 1,700 cases, it's amazing how many one or two level spine patients, uh, one or two level anterior fusion cases, even three levels, are going home post up day one or two. And I think that's a big deal. When you're in the hospital, you end up laying on that bed more than when you're at home. Sure. So, so we've talked today about some of the preoperative considerations uh, with regard to the prevalence of thrombotic disease. We talked about some intraoperative strategies to perhaps avoid venous injury, avoid prolonged retraction, uh, perhaps some considerations with regard to the approach, uh, anisoas lateral versus uh, a direct anterior approach. We've talked about some perioperative recommendations with regard to prophylaxis. Uh, I'll just go through the line and ask if there's any other comments that uh, any of you would like to make with regard to being an expert on anterior spine surgery and, and uh, thrombotic disease. I think uh, number one is very important to understand your anatomy and understand what uh, vessels you're going to be retracting or ligating. Number two, minimize uh, the manipulation of those vessels. Just expose, retract, and uh, you know encourage your spine surgeon to move along and getting the disc prep, get the implant in as safe as possible, and release your retractor blades as quick as you can release them. I'd echo that certainly. I mean, I think. Moving along, not hurrying anything, but being expeditious as you're doing your work is really important. I guess my question I have and, and posed to you guys as well is, let's say now a DVT has been diagnosed. Patients postoperatively, post-op day one or two had some swelling. I now have a DVT. It's been confirmed by ultrasound duplex. Good question. How does everybody handle that at their institutions? Well, if someone's diagnosed with a DVT and it's below the knee or below the groin and they got some swelling, I have no problem I'm putting them on anticoagulation for six months. I'm not gonna jump to the next level where I'm gonna suck that clot off or dissolve that clot. I think mo the moment the DVT extends into the pelvis and is now iliofemoral DVT, there are mechanical thrombectomy devices that do a good job at removing that clot and I would move to that next step on those higher up DVTs. So, so you know, Obviously, some of that has to do with how close to surgery you are, what was your surgery, how much is your worry. But, but our routine would be starting a heparin drip in a non bolus way, getting comfortable that we're in a safe position, and then starting something longer term and transitioning off of that. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so similarly, uh, starting uh, heparin uh, um, immediately. And then the role for thrombectomy has been rare in our institution. We actually have had a couple of cases recently where a vascular team or actually our, our uh, interventional team has done thromb thrombectomies. Um, um, my, my question becomes, when to use a filter? So we've used filters occasionally in, in stage patients or in patients who've been transferred in with a known DVT who are having surgery upcoming. Uh, we haven't used filters in our post-operative patients, but do you think there's a role for a filter? Well, I think you bring up a good point. I mean, if you have no issue with starting your patient on heparin, non-bolus, just start them on your dose, then advancing them to your agent that you're gonna use, 
and there's low risk of having a perioperative complication of a bleed, then there's no role to put an IVC filter. I think the role of the IVC filter in that patient is where you have a contraindication of starting your heparin and coumadin or whatever agent you're gonna use. Then I would place the IVC filter, wait to the point where you can start the anticoagulant and then remove the IVC filter at that point. What about the scenario where the patient's got an established uh, pulmonary embolus? Um, so perhaps subsegmental uh, embolus, workup for perioperative tachycardia, shortens of breath, CT uh, shows a uh, subsegmental emboli. Um, in that instance, does that change your recommendations with regard to use of a filter um, or your other chemical uh, prophylaxis? Well, that's a good question. You have a documented DVT. If you have a documented DVT on the lower extremity or not, it doesn't matter because it could have just all went to the lung space. Then my question would be, can I anticoagulate that patient? If I can anticoagulate that patient, that's the treatment of choice. If I can't anticoagulate that patient, then I would put in an IVC filter, even if I didn't identify a DVT on the lower extremity duplex scan, because odds are it came from the legs. If there's residual clot on a lower extremity scan, and subsegmental uh, PEs, does that patient get a filter? If I can anticoagulate that patient. If, if the patient is a candidate to be fully anticoagulated with a DVT on an extremity with a documented PE, the treatment, appropriate treatment is to anticoagulate that patient. Now, if that patient fails with anticoagulation, has another PE, now I would put a filter in that patient. I agree. Treatment for the DVT and the PE is going to be the same. It's going to be anticoagulation after I've had my discussion with a spine surgeon that it is safe to anticoagulate that patient. And only if there's failure or if there's bleeding where I have to stop my anticoagulation do I consider an IVC filter. One scenario that, that we run into and maybe manage it a little bit different is an isolated infrapopliteal DVT. Someone had some symptoms of swelling, they have an isolated posterior tibial vein DVT, am I going to commit that patient to full anticoagulation immediately post-op? In our institution, we're not. We are performing surveillance uh, ultrasounds for two weeks, one uh, at week post-op, uh, one week after it's been diagnosed, and then another one at two weeks. If there's any propagation of that DVT to another tibial vein, or certainly if it's the popliteal, then we make the decision to anticoagulate. Um, it's just a little small variance for, for, for how we treat these. John, what about you? An infrapopliteal DVT, does that get treated uh, chemically, or is that something that go, undergoes observation? Usually, if, if it's deep vein, we're going to anticoagulate. Yeah, my, in my practice as well, Tom. Uh, no, we've moved on to uh, starting. I, I usually put them on uh, 325 of aspirin, and then I rescan them at one week, maybe I'll re repeat it at two weeks, and if it's no propagation, I'm okay just putting that patient on aspirin, yeah. particularly if that patient is at home, ambulating, active. I think it, it's, it's a benefit not to be on a six-month course of anticoagulation in that particular patient population. Yeah, I don't disagree with the risk of anticoagulation. I also think that... Um, in, in the ideal circumstances that would be appropriate is to avoid anticoagulation and close follow-up. One of the real challenges that we have, especially in complex spine surgery, is being able to see that patient back reliably um, because the distance has traveled, because perhaps being at a rehab, and, and sometimes perhaps we're over-treating based on the fact that we might not be able to have such close follow-up. Good point. And so we schedule those ultrasounds prior to discharge, you know, at one week and then at the second one at two weeks. And if there's any phone call about any new symptoms, they immediately get rescanned. And if there's any propagation, then we initiate anticoagulation. Well, terrific. I think we've covered really a lot of topics here, and I really appreciate the interdisciplinary nature of this topic. I think having vascular surgeons and spine surgeons together, this is part of where I think optimal care uh, starts and the communication that we have with each other, learning from one another, and of course, uh, I think in the optimal care of the patient, uh, consulting with one another. So thanks for the opportunity uh, to participate. Thanks to our panel for offering your expertise, and uh, I hope this has been a useful, actually, expert session. Mm -hmm.